I am Sumit Gupta and this is Choosing Leadership, a podcast for high performers with big dreams at work and life. This is a podcast for people who know deep inside that there is more. Have you achieved a great deal of success, but on the inside you still feel empty and like an imposter? Do other people see you as a strong leader? And you wonder why it still feels so lonely and suffocating. The aim of this podcast is not to provide you more content, but instead shift the context under which you operate. I dare to speak to the tremendous power which you already have rather than what you believe are your strengths and limitations. This podcast is called Choosing Leadership because that is what leadership is, a choice. And this is the Leadership Journey Series. I am interviewing leaders with an interesting story to learn how they got where they are today. We all have a lot to learn from each other's stories of where we started, where we are now and our successes and struggles on the way. With this series of interviews, my attempt is to give leaders an opportunity to share their stories and for all of us to learn from their generous sharing. Ramon focuses on building ecosystems to address health disparities which are designed with equity and health as a fundamental starting point. His mission is to change how society views health. He thinks we cannot continue to depend on the providers of health care to fix our problems. He envisions a future where health care is a collaboration to maintain rather than repair an individual's health and wellness. Ramon shares his journey of coming from an immigrant family and how losing his grandfather to cancer allowed him to experience and later shape the role of healthcare in society. Today, he empowers individuals to take ownership and be more proactive when it comes to health. Treating everybody with dignity is one of his core values and he is giving dignity back by focusing on public health in underserved populations. Hi Ramon, thank you for agreeing to be a part of this interview and I'm all excited about hearing your story. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and, and I'm happy to be part of this and, and definitely privileged to, to share my experiences. Wonderful. So can you start by sharing who you are and what you do today? Sure. So I've had a, a, a very interesting non-traditional background. So uh, first of all, like I'm an immigrant to the US. I grew up in the Philippines. I moved to California when I was four and went to college and uh, graduate school in California. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. shortly after graduate school. So ever since I moved to the East Coast, uh, I've been, my focus has been on public health. So that's what my schooling was. And I describe my, my work as being a social entrepreneur. Shortly after I worked at the federal government in Washington, D.C., I really focused on social determinants of health and health equity. And I, from this work, I, I did a lot of consulting opportunities, consulting projects, and uh, as well as really jumping into the startup world. So that's a little snapshot of my journey to this point. Thank you. On your LinkedIn profile, you, you say that your mission is to change how society currently views health. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because that was very intriguing when I read that. Sure. Yeah, I think at least in the US, I, I can't speak worldwide, but from my experience, I've seen that communities and individuals rely on the healthcare system to make them healthier. And so if we have that mindset, we're functioning from like a, a reactive uh, rather than proactive. In the past few years, I've really focused on how to uh, empower and encourage individuals to take ownership of their own health and be more proactive. And ever since the pandemic, a, a word that I've been using most recently is personal agency, right? So having ownership and taking control of what you can control. And I think that's missing in the traditional healthcare system today. Okay. You said that you have always been associated with public health. Can you share anything that helped you identify this as the thing where you want to make an impact in the world? Sure. I actually, I came across public health very, um, randomly. So I was actually studying when I enrolled, uh, when I first enrolled in college, I was a, an engineering major. So I was a computer engineer and I learned through trial and error through my classes that it wasn't going to be a fit like future long-term. 
and gradually it, it kept moving towards healthcare. My mom finished in, in the Philippines as a physician. So I always had this push for healthcare in the back of my mind and, and from my family perspective, but I wanted to carve out my own path. And so I really explored other kind of career paths and I actually was pre-med after engineering. And then I, I studied abroad in Italy for, a, it, it's just a funny story. This is the interesting story that I usually share of how I got into public health. So when I get back from my, my study abroad in Italy, I couldn't enroll in any of the, the classes that I was required for my pre-med degree. And I actually just filled it up with some random classes. So I took some Italian classes. I took a lot of like general education requirement classes. And then I also just enrolled in a uh, intro to public health class, which was the first at UC Irvine where I went to undergrad. And that's where it just made sense. Like the whole pre-med route, um, I didn't see it as a fit because it was focused on like the clinical and, and cellular medicine. And uh, I think public health gave me a different perspective on a broader, uh, more social and uh, community aspect and, and, and the focus on prevention was key for me. And so it made sense. And that's what catalyzed my career from there. And as you spoke about that, uh, the story from Italy, is there any other events either, either positive or negative in, from your life that shaped who you are as a person and as a leader? Yeah, I think one thing that was, I think that I look back on all the time is so in, when, in 96, I was in, I think eighth or ninth grade, my grandfather was diagnosed with colon cancer and it was late stage. It was a stage four colon cancer. And he, we, we, we tried to give him all the treatments and, and all who he had the best healthcare, but that couldn't help save his life and extended his life for a little bit. Uh, so he, after a diagnosis, he was actually, he passed away after 10 months and, and we really tried holistic and alternative medicine. We were buying juice blenders and then doing wheatgrass. Like this was back in, in the late nineties. And so there wasn't a lot of research on this, but whatever information we could find, we really tried. And I think that experience, um, uh, after looking and, and really learning and looking back now, I understand a little bit better because he grew up in, in conditions in the Philippines that were not necessarily the best conditions from a food perspective, from a environmental, like with smog and then just pollution and just the habits. So I think all of those factors probably led to really poor behaviors. And then ultimately he died, you know, at 66, which is relatively young. If you look at the, the United States, like life expectancy, I think that definitely had a, an anchor, um, uh, memory, which kind of guided me towards this path. Thank you, Ramon, for sharing that personal story. And I can very much relate to that because I lost my mother to cancer as well. Mm -hmm. And I can totally understand like how that shaped what you wanted to do from that point onwards. And how did you find meaning from that incident? Yeah. And what kind of cancer was your, uh, your mother? Uh, she had uh, cervical cancer. Okay. She struggled with it uh, for nine years before she passed away. Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that also shapes a lot of uh, what I do today. Hmm. Uh, she, in a way, she was a rock for me. She was yep. always there. And what I try to do with my coaching clients is to be a rock for them, to be there for to supporting them. Yeah. So coming back to the, to the present moment and, and your story, what is it uh, that you like most about the work that you do and what do you find most challenging? Yeah. So since I essentially own my own business, I think that what's most fulfilling and, and what I always tell people if they want to go to entrepreneurship is that you're directing kind of the ship. So you're, I, I think it gives me the opportunity as an entrepreneur to explore what I'm passionate about and, and really dive deeper into certain things that catch my attention. But I think the most challenging on the other end of it, the challenging part is that there's not a lot of structure. So you're really autonomous, fully autonomous with your own time. And that requires you to self-regulate or self-manage. And it requires you uh, a lot of determination and a lot of persistence, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, the, to be able to go from an idea to getting it funded, to operationalizing, to getting revenue, it takes a lot of work, but I think it provides at least my personality. I, I need that ability to be able to be creative 
and decide when I'm most productive and when I can, I'm really doing inspired work. For me, I think it just fits my personality. And so that's what I would share with any other folks listening is that really follow what's the best fit for you in terms of your career. Yeah. And in terms of scheduling and in terms of having the time for creativity, as well as honoring the demands that you have as an entrepreneur, what has worked for you in terms of managing your time, in terms of scheduling your time that you can share with audience? Sure. So for me, I think only a, a few years ago, I really understood and, and took a self-assessment of when I was most productive. So I, I was really aware of when I was most energized during the day and, it, you know, hours of the day, I, I would schedule certain things. Like, so for example, in the mornings when there's not a lot of emails coming in, even during COVID, I got to a routine where I was waking up at two or three in the morning and it was, I had five, four or five hours of quiet time. There was no emails, no distractions. And I was just able to knock out a lot of things and do research and be in my own space and time to be able to be creative. And I was, at the time I was like launching a new startup. And so it really helped me to be able to juggle and manage consulting, which started around 8.30 to the workday, which is five o'clock or so in the U.S. So what advice would you give to someone listening and facing the same challenge? I would, I think my advice would be find out when you're most productive for specific tasks. So if it's like a, a very critical thinking task, figure out when it, if it's in the morning or afternoon or late night that you do that best and schedule your time around that. And then all the other less intensive tasks, I think schedule on alternate times for me, like having conversations and just phone calls is best for me in the afternoon. Cause I, I think my brain switches more into just conversation mode rather than like critical thought. Thank you. What I like about that is, is how you bring your meaning from the deeper story, which you shared, which is about changing how society views healthcare and then how do you bring it to your day-to-day -day life and prioritizing your time, scheduling your time according to your personal fit? Yep. Yeah. Since you mentioned that you are an entrepreneur and as you work with people, right? So, so you, you are coming from a very deep personal story, which gives you a lot of meaning and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. When you work with others, what has worked for you to get others on board or together to get others to see the urgency and see the value of what you're trying to create in the world? Yeah, I think when I meet new people, I try to immediately convey that I'm coming at it with uh, the best intentions and the most authentic intentions possible when I'm striking up either a new collaboration or inviting them to, you know, be part of the team somehow or collaborate in some way. I really establish that this, this work is meaningful to me and I show that it has value beyond kind of just the, the service level value. I think one of my most frustrating frustrations that I see is that uh, a lot of the startups focus a lot on marketing at the beginning and really just care about the, the image that they're projecting uh, for their company. But if you don't have the fundamental kind of social impact mission or just a, a fundamental, like how you're adding value, I feel like there's a missing element there. And I think for that's what kind of drives my kind of passion for this is is I think that I'm bringing something else that will, you know, ultimately impact uh, quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. One word which you mentioned is value, right? So I, I want to ask you, how do you define value, especially in the context of capitalism and entrepreneurship? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so I was fortunate enough to be part of a, an accelerator this year, and this was a impact venture firm called Conscious Venture Lab. And the first part, it was a four month like program. And the first two months were really around understanding our, our internal capacity value or like our internal as a team and as a person, leadership person, as a leader, what our values were. And I think one of my main things that I kept going back to, and I wrote down as part of our, our company is that we want to treat everybody with dignity. We think everybody has inherent value. So especially as I, I, my work in public health focuses on the underserved populations, what's very common here in healthcare is that 
you're labeled as a, you know, Medicare dual eligible or Medicaid, you know, patient and the labels have associations with it. And what we're trying to do is give dignity back and, and says, appreciates everybody and their lived experiences. And also what we, we really want to remain as a core foundational value is that it's not a zero sum game. So if we are successful, we're not taking away from another company or another nonprofit. We think that there are enough resources in the world that all of us can succeed. And we're more than happy to collaborate as much as we can in order to, I think our essence is to improve quality of life. Thank you. I also like how you talk about labels and uh, in the context of value, how can labeling people as whatever, whether immigrants or not, or whether Medicare or Medicaid can actually help us associate the labels with who they are and not to see their real value. Yep. Yeah. Is there anything okay. you would like to add, add to that? I think during COVID, a lot of people have been, especially leadership in very, in whatever sector they're coming from, I think they're starting to realize the value of everybody's diversity, one, and it, trying to make more inclusive products. And I feel like that's been missing because we've had these like labels because I, I guess from the startup aspect or just the early on early stage processes of startup, you group your populations or your target populations based on like consumer, you know, segmentation. And I feel like that kind of making the assumptions without really knowing that'll be fine for the short term, but then in the long term, I feel like that, um, will, will really catch up, uh, to a lot of companies. And so if we can go move away from labels and really trying to understand the populations that we're trying to get either our products, policies, or programs to just by creating a dialogue, starting a dialogue, rather than just making these assumptions that we think that we know them, I think that'll get us all closer to more impact as a society. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very relevant for the times that we live in. So as you go along in your mission and trying to create this change, which you want to see in the world, how do you manage pressure and overwork? Because there might be a lot of different viewpoints. There might be a lot of different opinions that you will, you have to deal with while moving ahead with your mission. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges is that there's either it's yourself and your team, or in my case right now, it's just myself guiding this startup, one of the biggest challenges is that you have to be self-motivated, right? And I think a big part of the accelerator program that I was in that I mentioned earlier was that it was focusing on what your values were as a leader and, and being able to return to that, knowing that, Hey, this is, this is why I am doing this. And this is why I wake up every day because I want to get closer to that. And another point is. If you can get even 1% closer than the day before, that cumulative effect adds up over time. And it, a lot of this work takes a lot of patience. Some of these problems are so complex that it's taken decades to create and that you're not going to be able to change anything overnight. And every day I try to just knock out as much as I can, even if it's three or a couple key things that I want to do that day, it's really just trying to move forward as much as you can. and and. And there's also one thing that I was thinking about earlier was even just on like doing research, right? So a big part of my, my work, both on the consulting side and, and on the entrepreneurship side is just connecting with people and connecting with the right partners. And so being able to be very knowledgeable and understanding of the landscape, uh, that you're in gives you that much more credibility once you have that connection to be able to position yourself really well. So. Again, like reiterating, like the more information that when the more knowledgeable you are, it creates this expertise and you become more credible once you have that opportunity to either have a conversation or pitch your idea. Thank you. So coming back to the, to your leadership, who has had the most influence on how you operate today as a leader? And if, is there a story which you can share that would be wonderful? Yeah. When I was in um, high school, I was taking a, a, a AP physics class. And the professor there, I think the way he taught was very meaningful to me because he essentially 
encouraged all of us to just put in the effort, even if you didn't know that the right, the right equation or the right way to get to something. But if you knew the second part of it, he was just focused on the effort. So you can say, Hey, I don't know this part, but the answer would be a letter or a triangle. And if you were able to plug that into the next part and, and get to your answer, he would still give you credit for that. And I think when I zoom into the present time, I think he was just instilling like principles of just put in the effort, explain what you explain as much as you can, uh, and then let somebody, let either your boss or your teacher or your professor decide and, and putting the onus on them, um, to see and assess what you've learned. And so I think as I recall that situation, I think it, there's a lot of insight there of just showing up. And even if you don't know all the answers, you can still share your own personal leadership or your own personal experience. And going back to the value part of what we discussed earlier, I think everybody has something to offer and contribute. And you just never know if that piece of information is going to make a difference. So just showing up is definitely one, one big thing. Another professor of mine in undergrad, it was the organic chemistry class. She was, I, li I liked her. I enjoyed her, her leadership style because it was, she expected a lot from everybody. And so I think when you, as a leader, put that foundational expectation out there, I think a lot of people want to go and meet it. And I'm not saying it's, it works for everybody, but for me, especially, I think I was challenged to be more engaged in that class and, and really stepping up. And then recently a couple of colleagues have been uh, great leaders for me and, and what I really appreciate from their leadership and, and mentorship with me is they don't necessarily give me the answers. They ask the questions so that I can answer the right direction based on what I'm experiencing or what I've gone through. So I think that's part of a, a great leader to me is being able to just ask the right questions and allowing everybody else to direct their answers. Now, Thank you for sharing these two stories, right? And, and what you shared, I'm taking two or three things from that. One is like the power of just showing up and do your effort every day, do what is required to be done without being obsessed with the with the outcome, which might be a long time away. Yep. The second thing which you shared is like demanding or expecting a lot and really believing in people around you. And that gives them the space to actually show up and perform in, in that space. And one last thing which you, which you shared, which I found very insightful is giving people the space by asking the right questions and having them come up with their own answers. I, I think this is, these are wonderful points and which we often miss in the hustle and busyness of day-to-day -day life. Yeah. And to follow up on that, I, I think sometimes our metrics of success are not calibrated for social impact. And so uh, a lot of the conversations I've had is like, how do we update or revise these metrics so that we're actually in, including social impact or the impact we have uh, on the communities around us or people who are we excluding? I think there needs to be a, I think more intentionality around capturing, not just the, the quantitative, but the qualitative part. And I think that's a powerful part of any either nonprofit organizations or for-profit organizations like story It's like, what else are you doing? And I think I've been fortunate to be talking to a lot of leaders, trying to move the needle wherever they are, uh, in their current role. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon, for sharing your leadership journey and sharing these wonderful stories and examples from your life. Is there anything else you would like to say to the audience who might be interested in learning about leadership? And is there anywhere they can find you and find more about their work? Yeah, I think one thing that I've been able to really take advantage of, and I don't think the older generation couldn't really take advantage of this, but I think the younger generation definitely has more of an advantage is there's so many resources out there. The internet has been able to really democratize access to information and knowledge and potentially leaders. So you can connect with people all over LinkedIn and reach out to them and connect with them. But you can also listen to them through podcasts or blog articles like this or various channels of information. And you can learn a lot more 
without having to go to a conference or without having to know them directly. I think there's a lot everybody can do if they want to be a leader. I think, I think leadership needs to be more, I don't think it just need like leadership in general is not just for people who are, you know, in executive roles or, you know, leadership roles, but it's everybody can be a leader and each one of us can take our, our personal agency and learn more about what it takes to be a leader and then really step up and be proactive. And anybody can find me on LinkedIn. And I think that's the easiest way to find me. And I'd have a couple like websites on there that you can also learn more about my work. Thank you, Ramon, for your time. And I think you shared a wonderful message that everybody can be a leader and that this looks like a wonderful place to end our conversation here today. So thank you once again for your time and sharing your insights. Thank you, Sumit. That's it for this episode of Choosing Leadership with Sumit Gupta. I choose leadership every time I record this podcast and I invite you to do the same. I invite you to design a life of joy, meaning, pride and satisfaction, not just for yourself, but also for those around you. This is what I do most naturally, to lovingly and gently provoke you, to help you see your own life, to help you see what you are already capable of. I say what might be uncomfortable for me to say or for you to hear, to show you that all our dreams which have been on hold are within our grasp. If you like the sound of it, do not forget to leave a rating. I invite you to subscribe to my newsletter at deployyourself.com slash newsletter. You can also reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook to share any other comment or feedback. I want to thank everyone who contributed to making this show a reality. And thank you for listening. Always remember that you are enough, you are loved and you matter. This is Sumit. Until next time, keep choosing leadership.